My name is Alan Taylor. I'm the managing director of Endeavor Catalyst, which is a global venture capital fund that invests in Endeavor companies all around the world, uh, from Brazil to Indonesia to Turkey uh, to South Africa. Uh, we have 75 investments around the world, including uh, 15 here in Brazil in companies like uh, Dr. Consulta, uh, Conta Azul, Resultados Digitais. Uh, we're also very proud investors in Rappi. In uh, and it is my pleasure to be here today to interview truly two of the most awesome founders and entrepreneurs that I know uh, on a few different topics related to scaling their companies. Let me turn it over uh, to these guys, the real stars of our show. Uh, and Simon, would you mind first just giving us a very quick introduction of uh, when you guys first started uh, Rappi? Sure. Thank you, Alan. Hey, everyone. Um, we started Rappi three years ago. We were eight guys giving away down, uh, donuts for downloads in a park. And uh, thankfully, well, the app started growing and we went through Y Combinator and that helped a lot. We, we were the first Latin American company to get invested by Andreessen Horowitz. And, and then, thing, thankfully, we were able to build an amazing team and, and we went to Mexico and we, we came here last year. Okay, great. Uh, and Fede, just real quickly, can you tell us the same of sort of when you guys first started uh, the company that, that is now Cargo X? Yeah, we started in, um, in May 2016. Um, so we, before Cargo X, we, um, we started another company called Sontra that today exists. So we already knew how the, the tracking market works. Uh, so Sontra went in 2013 to 2016 from zero to almost 30% of the trucking population in Brazil. So 30% of the trucks today are running on the app. Um, but it was really difficult to monetize. And then investors were like, look, you know, in Brazil, if you don't monetize, it's gonna be really difficult for you to raise money. So you're gonna be a poor entrepreneur forever. So we had to come up with another idea. And then we, we kind of like built Cargo X on the top of Sontra. So today we have a group with two companies. So Endeavor, has a lot of experience with entrepreneurs, I'll say the entrepreneurial journey, right? All these different challenges you face along the way. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about this for both of your cases, but, but Fede, maybe how long were you working on Sontra before you actually made this decision to, to start Cargo X? And can you tell us a little more about that decision and, and how that process worked? Yeah, sure. Um... Um, we started Sontra in 2013. Uh, everything started because I was, um, I come from Patagonia, Argentina, from the south of Argentina. I, I cycle a lot, I travel by bicycle a lot. I, I uh, you know, when you are traveling on a bicycle, you sleep what is safe, which is truck stops. Uh, and there I got to understand the problems of the truckers. So Sontra was born to solve the problems uh, that, that, that the truckers had. And we, we, we spent, between 2013 and 2016, uh, we spent that time trying to solve the problems that, that the truckers actually had, but we were failing to do so um, for, for different reasons. But the, the, the most clear reason is that we were not able to monetize. When you are not able to monetize the product is that no one really finds that the product is that, product is that valuable so that they will pay for it. And then in 2016, so three years later, we, we decided to start Cargo X, so it's like, call it like, uh, like, like a new business model or a pivot. And then from 2016 to today, we grew fairly aggressively. So we brought uh, different investors into the company. Today we are 300 people, full time in one office. Then we have 15 offices across Brazil. We have 11,000 full time trackers um, that, you know, they're big trucks operating between cities. And at Sontra, we have a network of, of 300,000 trucks. Um, and, and we plan to get to 100% of the truckers in, in Brazil soon. That, that's the, the target of the company. So that we want to take the whole trucking force in Brazil online. 
Uh, and I believe that's important because between 70 and 80% of the Brazilian economy today is moved by trucks. Um, so it's important to have that data online and to understand what's going on and also to understand how we can optimize the, the excess capacity that exists in the country. It, in many ways, it's, it's, it's an amazing story uh, and it's an awesome opportunity, I think, to digitalize or modernize an industry that's obviously been around for a long time. I, I want to come back to that, um, but I want to go back to the Rappi story. Oh, and actually, hang on. I'm making a small Rappi order uh, just before we start. Okay, cool. So hopefully that'll be here in just a few minutes. In, in an hour, maybe. An hour, uh-oh. Well, the panel only has 33 minutes left, so we'll... Oh, look at that. It's really fast. <laughs> Excellent. How about a hand for, uh, for our delivery? Now, I'm impressed. Do we, do we get to drink these beers, or they're just for show? I think we should drink one. Do you want one? Now that's what I call good delivery time. Uh, well, here, salut, cheers. <laughs> uh, so Simon, tell us a little bit more, because I remember your guys' relationship with Endeavor started out in Colombia with, with a, a prior company, with, with Grability, uh, and Rappi was in some ways kind of born out of that. Can, can you tell us a little more about that story? Yeah, we, we were a B2B company that licensed software to big supermarkets all around. So we work with Walmart in Mexico, with Reliance in India, El Corte Inglés in Spain. And, and we actually got bored wor working for these slow companies. So we convinced our investors to do a small experiment in, in, in Bogota to show these big companies that they could do better if they moved faster. And, and then, well, Rappi started growing, so we... And everything started moving faster. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, and the speed has been pretty remarkable. Yeah. How do you guys, how do you think about a company that's scaling this fast and growing this fast? What, what are some of the things you do to try to manage that? Well, you, you sleep little. And it's, well, Rappi is still growing at a 20% a month. So every three months you, you have a company that's twice the size. And it's hard to manage, but, but it's exciting. And, and, and it's great to work with people that love the adrenaline and, and, and the speed. And there's a lot of things that you can do in a week that, that usually you do in a month or two but you could really do it in, in, in a week. So that's how we, we think. Fascinating. I, I, I have lots more questions about that, but I'll, I'll keep us moving. Um, I want to talk about the Brazilian market or about Brazil because, you know, you guys are originally from Colombia, Fede originally from Argentina. Maybe Fede, I'll start with you. Why, why Brazil? Why did you decide to come and build this business here? And was it obvious? Was it a no-brainer? Were, were there other options you considered? Um, no, because there are a lot of trucks here. So. <laughs> um, no, That's I mean, a good answer. If, if, if you're going to spend time building a company, it's better to build it. Um, it's, it's better to build a, a, a large company. And here, the domestic, the domestic market is huge. Brazil is the third largest trucking market in the world. Um, and it's one of the largest economies in the world. And there is a massive need for what we are doing. You saw the truck and strike not long ago. The truck and strike means, dude, we need more money. We, we cannot survive. And then the, the, on the one hand, you have truckers saying we need more money. And on the other hand, these guys are running 40% of the time empty. So there is a clear problem to be solved. And this is one of the largest places um, where you can solve it. And like other companies, Cargo X is more of a domestic company is, is a little bit harder to, to, to expand internationally very quickly. Um, so you need uh, a very large domestic market in order to launch the company. And, and this is why Brazil. And how about for you guys, uh, Simon, how do you think about it? I mean, I've used Rappi in Mexico City, in Buenos Aires, in Bogota, obviously also here in Brazil. What, what made you decide to come to Brazil in full force and, and really invest in this market? We, we don't think about countries, we think about cities, 
Okay. And, and Sao Paulo is perfect for, for Rappi because it's large and chaotic. So what, what, what we're trying to do is, <laughs> but Bogota is also chaotic, but, but Sao Paulo is, is the winner. Um, <laughs> what we're trying to do with Rappi is, is that we have like two large groups in, in this type of cities. You have a big group that has everything in life but time. And then you have another like younger group, maybe there are students that need to pay for their tuition and need that extra money. So we connect them and it's like building a small bridge. And just by connecting these two groups, you, you end up having like a better GDP of these two groups and, and a better city with less contamination and more free time. And so how many cities in Brazil are you guys operating in now? Nine. Nine cities. Yeah. And is Sao Paulo the biggest market for you so far? Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. And I got a, a magic question just popped up from the audience uh, that says, how difficult was it to start in Brazil uh, with an existing competitor already in the market? I assume this is iFood they're, they're referring to. But what challenges does that present for you guys? Well, we, we already had uh, like a monopoly competitor in, in, in Bogota, in Mexico, and... and the thing is that when, when you become uh, a monopoly, you start relaxing and you start, uh, well, feeling important. Uh, in in Rappi, we know that we're only going to survive if we really um, help our partners grow. So there's a lot of restaurants in, in, in Sao Paulo that didn't deliver. Uh, restaurants like like Bulgur, that's, uh, if you want a, a hamburger from them, the only way to get them is, is from Rappi. So you start getting these restaurants, these like trendy restaurants online. And, and Rappi is a lot more than, than just restaurants. So, so you, our partnership with, with Paula Azucar is very important and with pharmacies and liquors 24 hours. So the difference between a, a marketplace like iFood is that you use it normally four times a month. People use Rappi with Rappi Prime 4.5 times a week. Right. So you get a lot more, more frequency. Well, and I, I have some friends here who I think use it four times a day. So th these are, these are the Rappi, Rappiholics, I guess, the addicted to the service. Um, I want to I switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, one of the main topics for this panel, uh, which is raising capital. Or one other way to think about it is, you know, bringing on partners, you know, venture capitalists or other types of investors as partners in your business, right? And I think each of you guys have been very successful in attracting uh, some really great partners along the way. Um, this is also what, what I do for a living. I, I help a lot of Endeavor entrepreneurs raise money and think about the right kinds of partners to bring at the right stages of the company. Um, so I have a few different questions here, but I guess to start at the start, um, Fede, maybe if you can take us all the way back, can you tell us about your first experiences raising money or the very, very beginning of thinking about raising capital for the business and what those were like? Yeah. Um, so we did everything that could be done wrongly. We did it. So we learned on the go, which is very time consuming and frustrating. Like for example, you know, you incorporate a company in Brazil and then you go raise money and then you find out that, you know, it's better to incorporate it elsewhere. Um, very amateur mistakes that, you know, burn you out with, with a little, little amount of, of investors that you have. You know, the Brazilian or Latin American market is not that large in terms of numbers of investors. So, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very tricky to burn out with the early stage investors you have. But um, I think it's important to have three things, basically, when you raise money. First, to show that, that you, you are able to recruit a, a very strong team, and you're going to have the commit, mi, commitment and persistence to go after the idea that, that you are, or, or the business model that you are proposing, and that you are going to be able to adapt and change. I think you know, most entrepreneurs have to change uh, the business model that they start with, so that's one. Two is to try to tackle a very large market. You need to think big. Otherwise, you know, venture capital investors are, gonna, are not going to, to, to be interested. 
Um, and third, it's important to show a little bit of uh, execu execution capabilities so that you have executed something before you go and, and you open and you knock the door of the first investor. Otherwise, you're gonna burn out very quickly with investor. And, and the fourth point, which is the one I did wrongly, is just read and understand what, you know, where you have to incorporate the company. You, you have to prepare the company for venture capital. So, you know, I think those were the, the, probably the most, the, the four most important lessons. And, and then obviously you need to get introduced. You cannot do call emails or you need to get introduced to the investor by, by someone that the investor trusts mm -hmm. so that you can get the meeting and they can take you seriously. In, a, in our experience, actually, oftentimes the best introductions are from other entrepreneurs, right? Other founders who maybe have been invested in by that company before. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the way the capital raising process works, whether it's in Brazil or in Silicon Valley or el elsewhere, I think is it almost always relies on kind of filtered or, or warm introductions. I wanna pick up on the third point you made though about kind of demonstrating an ability to execute or demonstrating some initial traction. I find this can of oftentimes be different in different businesses. So this is a question from the audience which was, which kinds of KPIs do you guys track to show traction and progress? And I might even turn it into, you know, what are the core metrics that you're kind of looking at and talking to your investors about to show that your business is really growing? If, you, if you're comfortable starting, we'll come back to Simone in a second. Uh, so it's tricky because it depends on the business you are operating with, but you know, you just, you just have to pick up a metric that represents the success of the business. When we started Sontra, it was a number of active, tra active tracks that we have in the app. Today we are still tracking that, but we are also tracking revenue and first march and et cetera. Those are our KPIs, really. Um, but, but then you also have to, to, to show trust. So in my case, you know, I got my former boss from the investment bank to invest, even though it wasn't an investor. That created a, like, like, like a stamp behind me that I was able, that I was someone that was going, going to be able to execute because your former boss knows how you work, basically. Right. Um, and then you have to, the, the KPIs that, that, that you establish have to be real KPIs that the investor is gonna buy, that's, uh, you know, that really represent the success of the business. The objective of Cargo X today is to take the trucking market online, and, and, and we have this objective for the company to have 100% of the truckers in Brazil on the app actively operating. So that's the key KPI that we have today. Okay, thanks for sharing. Uh, Simon, coming back to your guys' story a little bit, uh, how have you thought about the capital raising process? I mean, how, how do you even manage it between you and your co-founders, and you know, how do you focus on it? Because you guys have raised money several times now in the last couple of years. T tell us a little more about how you guys even think about that process. Well, we, we just run out of money and, and go and ask for it. <laughs> it's, it's, we hate fundraising, and I think every en entrepreneur hates to fundraise because um, your, your company is your life, and you go and present your life project to some dudes and, and they just say no, and then no, and then no again. So usually, like you see Rappi as a, from the outside as, as a success story, but, but it has been really hard to, to get each and every of those rounds. And, and thankfully we, we have, Investors are, that are visionaries and, and, and that have seen this happening in other parts of the world. Like now to invest in Rappi after that a Tuan IPO, that like the Rappi of China just did an IPO for 55 billion. So now like it's easy to invest in Rappi. But right. two years ago when no one knew about May Tuan and, mm -hmm. and we were a Latin American company, it was, it was hard. Um, and actually, some of the questions coming from the audience, interestingly, are about uh, China and, and other parts of the world. Here's one I like. Um, in Asia, and not just China, but if you look at Southeast Asia, you see businesses like Gojek or Grab that you know started out in the carrying and delivering people business, and now they're also delivering everything. 
Is that a benchmark for you guys? Do you think as your own business grows, will you be carrying not just my beers, but also me? No, we, we, we actually are, are more focused on things that save time for our users. And, and we're going to be a super app, kind of more similar to maybe WeChat and, and, and Meituan. And, and it's um, the, the conception of, of you having like, I don't know, a, a young cousin that can help with everything. So, well, you, you, there's no reason for you to go to the grocery store if you can get the same groceries delivered for a dollar and, and in less than an hour. So we, we, we are trying to understand, for example, our best users are a successful women that, that have young kids. Those, those, those women are, are amazing and they, they need to do a lot of stuff that we don't even understand. So being able to, to help them with that crazy lifestyle is, is what drives us. Mm -hmm. Fede, a, a question the audience wants to know is, you know, you talked about kind of some of the positive, uh, the positive message coming out of the, like the strikes, for example. But the other side of that is it's a political situation that can really uh, affect your business. How, how do you think about dealing with those challenges uh, from your own team or just how you guys plan? How do you think about that operating in a market that can be as, as chaotic as Brazil? So I, I think, the, you know, the good thing of running a startup and being an entrepreneur or what defines an entrepreneur, I mean, I, I, you know, entrepreneur, other than a difficult word to pronounce, I, I cannot pronounce it. Um, so what, what you have to do, you know, when you run a company is to be able to adapt and have the flexibility that no other company has. And when the load changes and when there is volatility or in, in, in the market, that volatility affects, for the worst part, to the incumbent companies. So one of the reasons why we are on tracking, which is a very unsexy industry, is, uh, you know, regulated, etc., is that we have the flexibility to adapt and the incumbent large corporations do not have. They have more money than us, they have more employees than, than we have, but, but we have this um, capacity to adapt and move very fast, very quickly. Um, the regulation changes, our objective stays the same, is helping truckers to, to produce more money, to utilize the excess capacity and to deliver the freight at a lower cost, higher quality and faster. So, you know, for us, I won't say it's great, but, you know, we knew this was going to happen, and, and it's going to keep happening in trucking and in every other industry. The, the world is changing very quickly. We find, at least in, in Silicon Valley, most of the most successful companies you see, it turns out that earlier in their life, they actually have one or two or sometimes even more what we would call a, a near-death experience, right? When, when the boat almost sinks completely. Uh, have either of you guys gone through something like that where you had a day, you looked at your partners and said, well, I, I, don't, I don't even know if this is going to work. You know, have, have you had a, a, a moment like that in the company's history? We have it almost every other week. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example on the, on the strike, just, just to be like very specific. You know, the strike goes, the country stops, we have like 300 people there doing nothing, a lot of trackers that were supposed to be moving freight and they are not. The client is shouting at us even though we didn't stop the country. Chaos. Everyone is like running around saying like... And we, we thought, well, you know, the world for the first time, other than the World Cup, is, is, the whole world is talking about Brazil. So let's go to the States and then, you know, let's knock the door at CNN, Fox and all the press and let's talk about, you know, whatever. We just show our faces there so we create advertising for our company. We were the only company doing that in the trucking sector. And we, I don't know, we lost X millions in revenue, but we won much more in free advertising, for example. Uh, so that's what you have to do. And sometimes you have, you know, those days that nothing is going to work, but they have to last for a minute only. Um, you know, you, you always have, like, very optimistic people at the company. So when I feel depressed, I go to talk to the optimistic ones. Uh, <laughs> that's good advice. Yeah. Uh, Simon? I think I... I um I think that a big part of, of, of being an entrepreneur is to not complain and, and always 
be finding a, a, a solution. Um, there's a great book called Positive Intelligence that, that says that the difference between successful people and not successful people is that successful people look at a problem as an opportunity and and a normal people look at as a problem as, as a problem. So so I we we, we have that in, in our values and, and we are always trying to well to to create opportunities for, for ourselves. For example, um, Rapid Cash is a service where where you can, we, 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 we started Rappi not, not as a great idea, or not as a brilliant idea of, of the founders. We started Rappi just as, as a grocery store on demand, but we had a, a blank field where users could order anything. And, and some users started ordering cash upon delivery. They didn't want to go to the ATM, so they ordered 200 reals. And, and that was a problem. Because the couriers gave the money and then they were asking for the money and we were saying like, why did you give the money to to a stranger? <laughs> but after after that becoming a problem, now it represents six percent of our sales, and and it's a great convenient service for for people. Um, coming back to the topic of investors, I think when we were talking ahead of time, Fede, you you were talking about how you're quite happy. You know, it's it's less about the the dollars you raise or the amount of money you raise, and it's more about the the people you're able to bring in with you uh, to sit on your board and to be a part of this. Why, in your view, why is it important to have world class investors when you're trying to build something as big as you are? Well, because you can learn from them. So you know, I mean, you know, when they say if you are like if, if you are the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room, and and, and this is what how I feel, like, how I don't feel, really. Like, the, the investors we have are really smart people. So we, we were talking, be, be, before the panel, we were talk, the, the panel, we were talking about the, the, the quality of the board meetings, etc. And, you know, it's really great when, when you sit on the table with, with people that are actually, you know, creating valuable ideas and they are helping you to solve problems that you've been thinking for a long time and they just give you, like, you know, other than, than, than connections and introducing you to people, they are able to think through the problems and help you out to solve those problems. So I, th I think that, that's very valuable to have import, like, uh, strong advisors and to have investors that support you and help you out through the process. Yeah. So it's very important. We, uh, I feel like we, we hear so much or we talk so much about smart capital and smart money that it's almost become like a like a buzzword or like a cliche now, right? Oh yeah, you know, investors or entrepreneurs will say, "I'm going to get the smart money," right? Okay, well yeah, that sounds like a better option than the dumb money. Um, so yeah, let let's all go get smart money. But in my experience, smart money is different things at different stages to different businesses, right? And so even in a business like what you guys might be building the smartest or best potential investor in year one might have been different than in year three, right? And so I don't know, Simone, if, if you guys have had an experience with that as you've thought about the different rounds of capital, kind of thinking about more than just the money, you know, what, what are the things you've looked for in those partners at each of the different stages? I think by far the most important thing is that investors let you work and and if you have investors that are that are aligned with a long term vision and they want to really as as an entrepreneur you want to impact the world you want to change the world as an investor sometimes you want quick returns and that doesn't well get along well if you have smart money you'll have investors that want that don't want a quick exit they'll want to be in your company for eight, 10 years, and then, then you are really like deeply aligned and, and you can work freely and, and, and well. Here's a fun question that came uh, from YouTube. So I guess people are watching us on YouTube. Uh, what was the most difficult stage of the fundraising? The very beginning, angel and seed? 
or the growth rounds you've, you've raised later and why? I'll ask both of you guys. Fede smiling, what's your answer? Uh, good question. All of them are really, in, in my opinion, some people say, oh, Angel, Angel was really easy and then it was really, it was, uh, really difficult and then it became easy. For us, it was really difficult in, difficult in different ways because when you are doing um, on the angel investment um, stage, no one wants to give you money and you want money from anyone when, when no one wants to give you money. <laughs> but then when you grow the company, you want to, you wanna, you know, put the volume up on your, on your comment that, you know, you want investors that do not micromanage because that is going to destroy your company. And you also want investors that are really sharp and they bet on the company for the long term, etc. And those investors are really difficult to get because those are the good investors. And everyone wants the good investors. Um, so in my experience, and I don't represent the markets, um, it was really difficult in every single stage because of, at the beginning, no one wanted to give me money. So, you know, it was difficult. <laughs> um, and then when everyone, when some people wanted to give us money, we were... Uh, and it was very funny because like, we went to a lot of investors and most investors said no and it was like, really depressing. And then like, a top investor like you know, Goldman or Blackstone comes on board and then you have a lot of investors that said no, that actually want to give you money now. And then it becomes really easy. But it became really easy because you got the top investor first. Um, it's, it's a really dif difficult answer to, to, to give you a, a short response. Yeah. Simon, what do you think? For us, it was the Series A, the, the price round. Mm -hmm. So we, we went through Y Combinator that I really recommend every entrepreneur to apply. Um, people should be investing a lot more in Latin America and they, they are just not investing in Latin America because they don't know a lot of Latin American entrepreneurs. They invest in India and we, like Latin America has twice the GDP of India, four times the GDP per capita of India, and there's a lot more busy money going to India only because of the Indian engineers in Silicon Valley. So right. we have to go and spend some time in, in, in Silicon Valley as a region. And, bi and build that bridge, right? Build between... that bridge, yeah. So yeah. We, we went to YC and our seed round was very easy because we were growing like, he like hell, so we, we had a great demo day and it was very easy. And in the seed round, it's all about the story and the excitement and, and, and it's more about the entrepreneur than, than the company. So if they trust you, you'll get the money fairly easy. But then the series A, you need to show the traction and the numbers and uh, these guys, our Series A was led by Sequoia, and Sequoia has the opportunity to invest in literally any company in the world. Any company in the whole world. Yeah. yeah. So, so to be able to get to those numbers that are comparable to the best companies of the world is, is the hardest. Interesting. So, so uh, at the beginning, uh, I, have friend, I have a friend that always says at the beginning you sell, you sell the future with your logos, with your background, etc. And then on the latest stage, you sell the future and the vision of the company based on the past with the numbers. Interesting. Um, how do you guys think about your own role as the company grows? And here's what I mean. In the beginning, uh, you know, when you're just starting, you're doing everything, right? You're, you're working on product, you're working on team, you're doing this, you're incorporating the company, you're raising money. Um, what about as the company really grows, what do you think are, you know, let's say as you get to a series B or a series C, what become the main parts of your job? You know, what, Simone, what are you spending most of your life on today uh, when you're not sitting up here drinking a beer, uh, talking to entrepreneurs from Brazil? What, what are you yeah. working on? I think, I think I'm maybe a, a, an exception, I'm, I, I, I have a compulsive, obse obsessive mind. So I, I, I do the same that I did at the beginning. I'm working at product, I'm interviewing people, I'm talking to investors, I'm solving um, issues with orders. I'm, 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 I'm gonna leave you my WhatsApp and if you ever have a, an issue with an abrupt order, please WhatsApp me. And I, I actually talk to hundreds of users a day. 
that gives me a lot of insight. So I, I think that there's some entrepreneurs are a bit more sophisticated. I'm, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm a builder and, and it's great to be with your team actually building stuff. Fede, how about for you? Yeah, I, I think, you know, on, we are still an early stage company, so I also get to do a lot of stuff. Um, but probably, you know, and, and the most important part of, of my job today on a daily basis, other than talking to investors, that I don't think is, is, is the important job, but it has to be, to be done, um, is recruiting and then establishing that common vision and making sure that everyone is aligned and following that common vision. Because if you bring, like, if you recruit really great people and then, you know, one is focusing to go over there and the other one is going over there and they are both really strong, then you are, you are in trouble. Um, so it's bringing good people on board, making sure that they are happy, you pay them well, um, and getting you know, the vision, the common vision there, and everyone works in harmony towards that vision. You know, it's interesting you mentioned recruiting uh, because there's almost like a joke in, in Silicon Valley that people will talk about of saying, yeah, when you get to a certain stage of scaling up, the founder really only has two jobs. Uh, fundraising and recruiting, right? And it's 50% fundraising and 50% recruiting. But, but I think there's an interesting uh, truth in that, right? That's sort of a joke, but the truth is that attracting great people to your company, whether it's at the investor level or at the team level, is kind of the core role of the founder, right? Is sort of selling that dream and, and being a part of that. Uh, and Endeavor has seen that you know, we work in 35 different countries all over the world, and, and really it's the same story everywhere, right? Whether, whether you're in Latin America or Africa or Asia or the U.S. So, um, Simone, I'm going to come to you just because we were talking about this a little bit before the panel. Um, how do you think about that for a market like Brazil? How do you go out and get, you know, the best possible team you can for for Rappi, and, and, and what are you guys focused on in, in that regard? Well, it's, it's, it, it's a, a bit harder to convince people because our Portuguese is not great and, and our English is not amazing. Um, but thankfully, we've, we've been able to, to attract amazing talent in Rappi. You need to find those special guys that, that, that are um, really smart, but that they have the, the entrepreneur DNA mm -hmm. and, and, and they're hungry and, 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 and they want to change the world. And, and there are not a lot of people that, that, that really know what that means and the sacrifice that that needs. So, but whenever you get one of those guys or, or girls, you know that you have like a real partner to improve the world. So that's, that's an amazing feeling. I want to talk just for one second about sort of the global market uh, outside of Brazil and particularly about benchmarking because I think it was interesting what you said about some of these stories in China now helped international investors realize the potential of a business model here. Uh, for each of you guys, how much time do you spend paying attention to what's going on in, in the rest of the world? Because I think that that's certainly the lens a lot of investors are using, right, as they're kind of tracking China and the U.S. and India, et cetera. But as founders, are you spending time on that? Fede, is that something you look at, kind of what's happening with trucking in, in some of these other markets? Or is Brazil so unique that you mostly just focus on Brazil? No, uh, I think not, nothing is so unique so that you don't look at other companies in the world today, nowadays. And, and everything is changing very quickly to become more similar. Um, we do. I know, like, you know, all my U.S. equivalents, um, getting to know our Chinese equivalents. I, I think it's important, but you don't have to overrate it. It's important to know what's going on. But th th there is a saying that says something like, losers focus on, on winners, and winners focus on winning. So, you know, you have an objective, and you have to spend your time on, on achieving that objective. But it's also important to keep your eyes open to understand what's going on in the rest of the world and if there are ideas that, that you can bring and implement. But that doesn't mean that you have to, to, give a lot of to, to put a lot of your focus on, 
on, on your competition. I love it when, when you have competition that is more focused on what you are doing than the actual challenge, actual challenge ahead. Um, that's probably you know, the worst mistake that early stage entrepreneurs do, is to focus too much, too much on the competition and the US equivalent, et cetera, not on the actual challenge to, to disrupt the market that you are operating at. I, I think it's a great quote. I don't know who said it originally, but I like that. Lose, losers focus on the Federico winners. Vega. No, sure. <laughs> <laughs> winners focus on winning. So uh, certainly a couple companies up here that are very focused on winning. So a, a couple things, and we will take one or two more questions from the audience if you add them here. But I want to turn to you guys explicitly kind of in thinking about advice for younger entrepreneurs or advice for folks who are just starting, uh, you know, they certainly look up to your stories that I would call success stories in the making, right? There, there's, some, there's some markers here that you guys are on your way to building something really big. And in some ways, I think you can be helpful to the folks who are one or two steps behind. When entrepreneurs approach you for advice and say, oh, you guys have you've done such an amazing job raising money or you've done such a great job scaling, you know, how can I be like you, right? What, what, what kind of advice do you give younger, younger founders, uh, maybe particularly related to fundraising or just related to building their companies? Uh, Simon? The number one advice is um, to really be sure if, if they want to be an entrepreneur, because it sounds sexy, but it's not at all. And, and it's more of a vocation than a job. If you want to be an entrepreneur to make easy money, it's, it's going to break you. If you want to be an, an entrepreneur because you want to create an impact and you want to serve people, maybe that will give you the strength to, well, to, to, to be healthy and, and, and be able to pull it off. So I think that a lot of young guys uh, need to have that reflection. And if, they, if it's if, if they came to this world and they have something here that they need to share with the world and it doesn't shut up, then you should be an entrepreneur. If not, there's a lot of other ways to make easier money. Mm -hmm. Well put. Um, Fede? Um, I think two advices for two different types of entrepreneurs. The first one is, you know, if you don't have experience, you don't have connections with, you know, in order to build a company, you need to, you know, want to really want to do it, and then you need money to do it. So, if you don't have the connections or the like, the, the, the network of VCs, etc., it's important to probably work at, you know, when you said you, you need a different canyons, you are basically looking for entrepreneurs. That's great because you learn how to be an entrepreneur, and then you get to know people that know the VCs. So when you actually leave the company and want to start your own company, then you probably have someone that is going to introduce you and learn and, and learn English. Um, that's, you know, for, for the people that do not have the initial experience in the network. If you do have the network and the experience, etc., I would say focus on hiring great people. Make sure they are well compensated, motivated, and, you know, be very clear on the vision uh, so that they are all working in harmony towards the same objective. That's very important. I guess one, one question that came up a couple times that we didn't touch is when it comes to hiring, and really convincing amazing people to come join you, obviously you have to compete against big companies, right? And, and, and big companies, we have this problem at home, you know, you have to compete against Google and Facebook and Apple and all these guys. When you guys are having a conversation with someone you really feel is a great fit for your team, what are some of the ways you, you convince them to come and join your team, right? If, if it might not necessarily be the highest salary, but you know, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, if, if, if you're talking to, to an entrepreneur and you're telling everyone that you want to work with entrepreneurs, then you have to be coherent and you have to share the upside. So in, in Rappi um, has, has, has an opportunity to, to, to be a 30, 40 billion dollar company and, and there's a lot of people that are going to build uh, well wealth not thinking on that, thinking on the impact, but sharing the upside is for sure something that will make you partners and not like the normal employee-boss relationship. Yeah. Fede? 
how do we convince people? We, we look for entrepreneurs. So I always say that you don't need to build your own company to be an entrepreneur. You can join a startup. You know? um, so if, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to build things and change a large market, then you know, that, that, that's what I say to people. You know, do you agree with changing Brazil through changing the trucking market, which is a massive pro uh, problem? And, and, and if the person is an entrepreneur, they will probably want to join us because you don't have to go through all this process of raising money, being poor for three years. Um, so you are on the fast track to become a, we believe we are on the fast track to build a large corporation. So we have one minute left. I want to close with this question. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we see that in the, in the world of entrepreneurship, uh, it takes about 10 or 15 years uh, to build an overnight success story. Right, and then it shows up in the media in the headline of this company, overnight success, you know, listed on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or acquired for $10 billion. But we know at Endeavor that usually that's been a labor of love. It's been a five, a 10, a 15 year process in the making. Um, so I wanna close by asking each of you guys, if you close your eyes and you kind of imagine, let's say 10 years from now, which is a long time, or even 15 years from now, uh, what is Cargo X and, and what is Rappi and, and how does the world maybe look a little bit different uh, because of these companies being in our world? Fede, do you want to go first? There is a saying that says something like, people congratulate you in public for what you suffer in private. So it's kind of like, um, our mission is changing the trucking industry starting for Brazil, helping, we believe that the industry is gonna change worldwide and you know we are after, after that taking the company online and improving the life of of truck drivers today so you know in 10 years we will probably be at a whole different stage to what we are at now and we start changing the brazilian market we will probably change other markets too okay thanks simon i i believe that in latin america there's the opportunity to build a like the alibaba there's no 800 pound gorilla here um, so we, we really think that we can, we can be that tech company that inspires the region, that keeps on bringing investment, and, and that change the way that people live their daily life. Awesome. Um, well, I think that is the end of our time. Uh, as all you guys know, and if you heard a lot about today, Endeavor truly believes that entrepreneurs are the ones that can and will change the world. Um, we particularly think that when entrepreneurs think big about what they're aiming at, uh, they can make a huge difference. And so I want to ask the audience to join me in thanking uh, two entrepreneurs who are thinking quite big. Uh, thank you guys very much for, for being here and spending some time with us.